and we probably will start in a few minutes. Welcome everyone. Um, it's Thursday, the 7th of October, and it's my pleasure to see so many friends, colleagues, um, uh, old and new here today. Uh, Richard will be hosting this um, session. I'm greatly uh, grateful and indebted to New Zealand uh, uh, Republic of Korea Friendship Society. And I'm just putting my mobile phone on the mute mode, so it's you know, distracting. And I believe that uh, we should be able to start in a moment. And when we, um, if you have uh, questions, please use the chat. Yeah, many uh, already using the chat. Pangap Sunida, Yorubun. So thanks for organizing indeed. And it's great to see uh, already 20, 27 people all together and, and it's counting. So yeah, Richard, I think hmm. it's um, already two sure. minutes past. So I'll mute myself and wait until. Okay, Yorobun, Anyamaseo, welcome to the seminar. It's, it's lovely to see you. We had the good fortune to have Leonard Petrov with us in June 2017 for a seminar here in Kitty Kitty Royal Hamilton called Pathways to Reunification. And tonight is a well planned and deliberate step after that seminar to engage with Leonard again. Uh, we didn't foresee in 2017 that the world would have changed in a number of ways, politically and medically. But it's wonderful to see everybody here. And Leonard, thank you so much for giving us your time and uh, your expertise. I want to acknowledge Gina Lee. Just wave Gina, wherever you are. Uh, Gina's been part of the organization of, of this seminar tonight. I think that's all I need to say, everyone, just in terms of the, the housekeeping. Uh, Leonard will speak for, I understand, around 40 minutes, and then there's time for questions. And perhaps the best way to deal with the questions is if, if as Leonard said, you write a question into the chat, might be the best and fairest way of doing that. Uh, Leonard's title or topic is called Challenges and Opportunities for Inter-Korean Cooperation a timely and uh, fascinating theme. I'll hand over please to my co-chairperson of the New Zealand Korea Friendship Society, and that's Ko Jong Lee. 안녕하세요, 여러분 반갑습니다. 이렇게 함께 어, 모든 민족 분들이 모인 곳에서 한국어로 인사할 수 있어서 반갑고요. 오늘 페트로브랑 함께 남북 협동을 위한 장애물과 기회인데 저는 장애물은 여러분들도 다 아시죠? 근데 기회는 어떤 것이 있을까? 거기에 어, 저는 관심을 갖고 있는 거거든요. 그래서 함께 오신 우리 어, 윈텍의 에드워드 박 이사님 또 박상열 또더 좋은 세상 또 회장님 기타 저 많은 분들이 김아람 의원님 또 많이 보이는데요 모두 모두 반갑고요 끝까지 함께해서 좋은 그런 시간이 되었으면 하는 바람입니다 예 감사합니다. Thank you, Jomi, and thank you, Leonard. I think I'll mute myself now uh, and yeah. hand thought, over to you, Leonard. Sorry, Gina. Sometimes you can translate us some and read. Yep, Gina. Yep. Thank you. Thank you, Richard, and thank you, Chong Mi, uh, for this introduction and for the invitation. Um, it's my second opportunity to talk to New Zealand Republic of Korea Friendship Society. The first time was in person back in 2017. Well, these days uh, we're using the um, uh, electronic devices, but I still feel this warmth, of friendship, and your collegial support. So please um, uh, ask many questions. Use the chat um, later when we have a Q&A session. Perhaps you can use voice. Let's uh, turn it not in, into a lecture. I don't want to lecture you on uh, inter-Korean relations. I, I want to learn from you. 
and it's my uh, pleasure to welcome you here. I'm in Sydney right now. Um, I'll start sharing my um, my um, my screen. But before that, I just want to welcome you from uh, from the land of uh, uh, Kuringai people, um, mainly um, the lovely suburb of Sydney, where International College of Management uh, in Sydney campus. Uh, is and um, we teach uh, postgraduate studies, we teach undergraduate uh, students and um, ICMS, International College of Management in Sydney is the leader of professional focused education. So we teach here um, students for uh, their personal uh, success in their professional life. And if you want to know more about ICMS, I would be happy to uh, discuss and answer your questions. But today the focus of uh, my presentation is um, on the um, inter-Korean relations, the, uh, the difficult topic of uh, Korea, Korea's division, um, uh, Korea's um, you know, divided families, separated uh, families, um, uh, you know, broken links in um, both physical, uh, emotional, personal, Links and um, this um, topic of Puk uh, Nyogi to John Gua Kihe is something what I've been um, doing researching for a long, long time. So most of the pictures, like the, the pictures taken by uh, me uh, when I was in Pyongyang on the left, it's a Tongil Kuri, um, uh, the street which uh, links Pyongyang, the capital of North Korea, with the demilitarized zone which separates. Um, Korea and also the um, this uh, metal divided world um, uh, a, a monument uh, just in the demilitarized zone in the southern part of, of this of this line. Today we're we're going to talk about Korea unified and and divided. Um, a, a, a little bit of insight into the history uh, of the problem will show us that the Korean War is still continuing. And the question is how we can, uh, how can we end the Korean War? So um, perhaps a good um, case study uh, would be to look at the Sunshine Policy, which was um, introduced uh, by the uh, South, former South Korean President Kim Tae-jun. And for 10 years, it demonstrated um, success. Um, perhaps it was too successful for its time, but it also had some um, downsides and shortcomings, we will mention that. And finally, we'll try to project some scenarios for the Korean reunification. But reunification is the ultimate goal. What else can be, uh, can be done before we reach that final destination? Uh, a few words here, I believe um, it's not exaggeration, just to list a, a few things which worry all Koreans, North and South. Uh, of the peninsula and Koreans overseas in Australia, in, in New Zealand, elsewhere. Certainly these uh, common um, sentiments for Koreans, um, both on the uh, in, in Korea and, and abroad is the potential danger of the resumed war, the continued national division and the economic difficulties which uh, people of South and North Korea uh, witnessed um, well, basically since the end of World War II. But many things also make uh, Koreans proud about, uh, about themselves, about their nation, about their land. And again, I believe you will agree that the, those things which make Koreans proud are quite universal. It's, it's a national past. It's the beauty, natural beauty of the Korean Peninsula and the cultural heritage uh, which they inherited through the thousands of years of history. Some may claim it's a 5,000 years of history. So let's look at the, uh, a, brief, um, a, a brief overview of those, say, four plus thousand years of history. The old Choson, the first, the ancient state, sometimes a mythical state of Korea. And interestingly, just um, we chose this date for, for the presentation today, the seventh, just, um, just less than a week away from the the important day of the National um, Foundation Day, Kechonjol. Uh, all Koreans, North and South, celebrate the 3rd of October. Uh, and the um, mythical founder of Korea, Pangun Haraboji, um, well, always associated with the mountain Pek to uh, Tebek San and the northern part of the 
peninsula. But we, we can see that uh, ancient Korea was divided, was not just uh, covering the whole peninsula. Ancient Choson, Ho Choson, and Sam Han were not the same state. Even the three kingdoms uh, during the first millennium of, um, uh, of, the, of the Christian era also was um, showing, demonstrating the uh, division of Korea, the Koguryo uh, kingdom in the north, uh, Pekche and Sila in the south, and, and the Kaya principality um, uh, in, the, in the extreme north of, or south of the peninsula, again, uh, showed that the, the Korean state was not unified um, for, for quite substantial uh, period of time before it actually, the first attempt at unification happened by the uh, Sila kingdom and um, unified Sila existed for approximately 300 years, but again, it did not unify the whole peninsula. At the same time with Sila, there was also Parhe uh, kingdom where perhaps some dissidents from, from the Koguryo uh, kingdom could find refuge and create their own own culture. Uh, and the first, perhaps the first uh, unified state in the Korean history was the Koryo dynasty, although it did not cover the full, like the um, complete um, the shape of the current borders uh, of, of the contemporary Korea. But for approximately 1,000 years, we can, we can claim um, the, the unified uh, Korean state existed. First, it was Koryo, and then the Choson, Yi dynasty uh, Choson. Um, kingdom. So, a thousand years of unified history uh, left a great legacy and also um, strong perception of Korea as one unified nation with same language, similar language, same blood links, uh, and um, homogeneous culture. So, um, national uh, his, national authors, historians, intellectuals uh, always worried. Um, about the reason that the country, the culture, the nation, the civilization of, of, of more than a thousand years of history easily fell prey, uh, victim of the um, colonial uh, contestation. And the prominent Korean intellectual, uh, the member of Kehwadang, uh, Yu Kil Chun, um, after traveling to the United States, after studying in Japan in Keio University, after traveling to the United States and studying Massachusetts, uh, wrote a, um, a, 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 a piece, a piece of research known as um, a thesis of neutrality, Chung Nibron. And uh, in his thesis, um, Yuki Jun argued that um, the best way to avoid um, the imperial contestation um, by the superpowers, China, and uh, at that time Russia, uh, France, Japan, and the United States, would be uh, giving Korea a status of a neutral state. Um, neutral neutrality can be temporary during the war, but it also can be perpetual. And Yuki Jun argued that uh, countries like uh, Belgium, Bulgaria, Switzerland, um, they all enjoyed peaceful um, uh, peace and harmony because of their neutral status. Um, at that time, well, it was the late 19th century, um, the, struggle between China and Japan in, and Russia uh, intensified particularly around the Korean Peninsula. The, the peninsula which, uh, which linked with, with a natural bridge between the continent and the islands of Japan uh, was always in the plans of, of great empires uh, to conquer, divide and, and rule. And also plans to divide Korea were also contemplated by the Russian Empire, by St. Petersburg and, um, and Tokyo. Um, in the in the early 20th century, and they planned to divide the peninsula along the 39th parallel at that time. It didn't happen because Japan won the war against Russia and against China and colonized Korea. So for the long 36 years, Korea was a colony. But the idea and the aspiration for Korea's modernization and enlightenment survived. So Yuki Chun um, had a number of followers, and, and despite of accusations of being pro-Japanese or, or um, someone who participated in the um, 1884, uh, um, uh, actually put him on the sideline of the mainstream uh, intellectual um, debates in Korea until 1945. 
because what happened in 1945 affected not just Korea, but all countries of, uh, of the region. Uh, China became divided. Uh, some islands of Japan still uh, controlled by foreign uh, military. And what happened to Korea was particularly traumatic um, because Koreans believe that this um, Japanese colonial occupation would end uh, in 1945, but it didn't uh, because the Soviet and, and, and the US armies decided to not just liberate, but also occupy the peninsula and instill and also install their own, um, uh, own, own or supported the government um, in the Republic of Korea in the South and the Democratic People's Republic in the North. Um, so expecting those client states would later permit um, or help unifying the peninsula by force, of course. And this is how the Korean conflict um, started because the Korean War, which started on the um, uh, 25th of June, 1950, started as the War of Unification the drive to unify the country was as strong in the North as it was in the South. And the front line was going up and down uh, North and South of the peninsula. It uh, ended badly, um, particularly for the families, uh, which became divided and divided permanent, almost permanently since the Korean War, uh, majority of the divided families or members could not meet. And the whole, uh, mm, genre of the Korean war divided families like this uh, um, demonstrates the tragedy, continuing tragedy of Korea. Um, the infrastructure, the economy uh, suffered as much as the, as, this, as, uh, this, as the society. Some 4 million people died during the Korean war, including Koreans, including the Chinese uh, people's volunteers who, who tried to save the deeper arcade. Uh, from imminent defeat, and um, Australians, New Zealanders participated in that war too. Uh, the destruction was um, so severe that it took decades uh, for both North and South Korea to recover uh, from, from the damage. And um, so since, uh, since that time, Korea has been divided. Uh, the armistice agreement, which um, was never or has never been yet replaced by a firm peace, um, uh, stipulated that there would be demilitarized zone four kilometers uh, uh, wide and uh, for 250, 245 kilometers long um, with just a very, very limited number of crossing points like the joint security area uh, near Seoul and between Seoul and Kaesong. Both militaries confront each other. There's more than a million soldiers in the north and uh, more than half a million soldiers in the south. And uh, joint military exercises create um, periodic tensions on the Korean Peninsula because it, they are considered to be the preparation for another uh, in, invasion or uh, an attempt to finish the uh, to finish the business of unification by force again. But we also sh should look at the demilitarized zone as uh, as the interface, as the um, point where North and South Koreans talk and cooperate and um, communicate. And we'll talk about the most recent um, development on that front uh, later today, uh, where the uh, Inter-Korean Liaison uh, Communication Office has been uh, has resumed its activity. So, when we, if we summarize the position of the Republic of Korea as a as a thriving democracy, but we have to remember that democracy in South Korea uh, started just a, a couple of decades ago, um, less just thirty years has passed, um, but already South Korea is today is the 10th largest economy in the world. Uh, that what, this is something what makes Koreans both North and South proud. Northerners also understand that the Republic of Korea live a uh, very affluent uh, life, uh, but the shortage of mineral resources and the uh, absence of uh, direct uh, land routes to the continent make um, South Korean economy somehow vulnerable. And uh, we'll talk about the uh, potential collaboration and synergy which North and South could uh, achieve if they start collaborating. Uh, because DPRK, North Korea has been a dictatorship and an economic, uh, economic autarky uh, since day one, since 1942, it, um, it was struggling economically, partly for the uh, 
because of the mountainous terrain and partly because of the man-made um, mismanagement. But starting from 2013, the, the policy of parallel development uh, from Jean Rosson was introduced. And this policy actually emphasizes the parallel development of economy and security. So North Korea is using its uh, mineral resources for both export and defense. And every time we see a rocket launched or a new type of weapon uh, tested, we have to remember that North Korea uh, has sufficient resources to, to, to do that and also need um, the means of protect its national sovereignty. Let's look at the statistics uh, which both North and South Korea present these days. So these are the most recent um, data. So the population of North Korea is only half of what it is in the South, which creates certain um, concerns about potential of um, uh, unification. So maybe unification like a federal model is going to be a problematic if, uh, um, if South Koreans are overrepresented over the North, Northern population. But the GDP of North Korea is only a fraction of what South Korea is currently uh, demonstrating in its uh, output. So the per capita consumption in the South is uh, significantly higher, but it's something for North Koreans to aspire for. Can, we, uh, can uh, the Korean War be ended one day? Is it, is it possible? It should be, uh, shouldn't be a no-brainer of ending the conflict which started 70 years ago. But it has been a long uh, path, long way of, um, uh, of an attempt to reconcile the, um, the North and the South. And um, it started just 20 years after the Korean War uh, began with uh, the secret visit uh, from South Korean um, chief of security, Lee Hurak, uh, to Pyongyang uh, in July 1972, when the joint um, uh, declaration, the Nambu uh, Kongdong Songmyon was um, the statement, North South Korean statement was signed and it stipulated that national unification can be achieved, but on the main three principles, the independence, Chaju, the peace, so the unification has to be peaceful, and the grand national unity, um, the Temenjok, uh, Minjok Tetangyol principle also has to be um, emphasized. So it has to be done by Koreans themselves. Uh, what they claim. So um, the spirit of um, 1972 North South uh, Joint Statement uh, was actually inherited uh, 20 years later. Um, during the uh, number of meetings when the Soviet Union collapsed, when Eastern Bloc countries uh, turned to, to democracy, uh, North and South Koreans also realized that they need to talk. And um, uh, perhaps the best timing for that was 1991, when both North and South Korean delegations met and uh, signed the basic agreement on non-aggression, reconciliation, exchange, and cooperation. This was the first um, landslide movement towards reconciliation between North and South Koreans, followed by another very important agreement uh, just 12 months later, the joint declaration on the denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. So these are the two main um, uh, pieces of legislation uh, agreements uh, which provide North and South Koreans with an opportunity to visit each other and even though the Pyongyang and Seoul don't recognize each other politically, diplomatically, they still can uh, say visitors, uh, governmental delegations, business, uh, entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial, sorry, interpre um, the business activities also can rely on those basic agreements. But more importantly, um, about a decade later, there was another um, significant break through in inter-Korean relations. The, um, in year 2000, uh, former President Kim Tae-jung uh, met with uh, North Korean uh, Chairman Kim Jong-il in Pyongyang. And during those three days of, of the first, that was the first historical summit between North and South Korean leaders, the um, joint North-South declaration was signed, which emphasized that the, the unification must be based on joint efforts on independence, confederation, humanitarian consideration, trust, and dialogue. This was all codified in that agreement, in that declaration. 
And if we look at how, why, uh, how come that became possible um, for the North and South Koreans to talk after, after almost five decades of um, Cold War. It was because of uh, President Kim Tae Jung's um, uh, sunshine policy. Hip Hip Chong Chek uh, formulated uh, four major principles of attitude from South Korea to the North. Uh, and the, those four principles were quite interesting and, and easy to remember. Easy task first, uh, President Kim Tae Jung claimed, and difficult task can be, um, can wait until later. Give first, take later. Very simple principle. I think it it was it was very easy to follow, uh, as much as economy first and politics uh, could come uh, later into into the scope of, of discussion between the politicians who always find uh, the reason to uh, to 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 uh, for the conflict and civilian context. Uh, President Kim Tae Jung um, uh, actually. Focused, he was he was really promoting civilian co context over government involved involvement, and we saw that um, sunshine policy actually achieved uh, quite significant um, results. So uh, it was not easy to achieve, but during the ten years of sunshine policy, a number of uh, joint projects were uh implemented and realized like Kungansan tourist resort which functioned for for the 10 years and uh, with the support of hyundai corporation um the uh, Kungansan resort actually accommodated uh, about four four million koreans from the south and also overseas foreigners i've been to Kungansan resort just uh um before it closed um, there was also the Kesong Industrial Complex, which uh, survived longer until 2016, um, where 50,000 North Korean workers uh, were managed by 800 um, South Korean managers. Uh, more than 100 companies and corporations operated there. And even the Inter-Korean Railway was reconnected um, uh, first time since the Korean War. And even the Kesong city tourism you can see on the, in the picture um, people would get on a, on a tourist bus in the middle of seoul in kwa Hamun, and 40 minutes later they would cross the demilitarized zone and visit the ancient capital kesong the cap former capital of Koryo dynasty it was sensational it was difficult to believe but at the same time or soon after the sunshine policy was discontinued uh, the problems began and we saw the chonan Corvette sinking and the Yongpyeongdo Island uh, shelling um, in year 2010. So obviously something uh, went terribly wrong. So what what was that? Well, it, I believe that was the deliberate disruption of sunshine policy, both in the north and in the south. And, um, but Kim Jong Un got seriously uh, ill in year 2008. So the military, North Korean military, decided that. Inter-Korean train is a major security for the North Korean threat. They couldn't guarantee the uh, security of um, tourists. So the Akwangja incident um, happened in um, year 2008 when the South Korean tourist was shot dead by the North Korean military. And also in the South, South Korean uh, government, the uh, um, conservative government of Lee Myung-bak um, discontinued the, the sunshine policy or policy of peace and prosperity straight away as, as soon as they got into office in January 2008. So they were not interested in continuing this um, policy because it was considered to be too expensive. Many criticized the policy of being um, lavish and uh, simply undermining national security. It was like anytime North Korea needed money, they would turn towards South Korea and Seoul would give them cash. So for about 10 years, there were no uh, dialogue, no communication, cooperation, no visits. And only in 2018, with the um, opportunity to march together on the unification flag in Pyeongchang Winter Olympics, North and South Korean athletes um, visited each other, and, and even the um, top North Korean officials managed to go to South Korea. And President uh, Moon Jae in um, also met with uh, Chairman Kim Jong un. Uh, three times, two times in the demilitarized zone um, in April and May. Uh, there were two historic summits and also 
in North Korea in uh, September 2018. Um, here is the picture of, of this summit in uh, Pektusan Mountain, the sacred mountain for all Koreans in North and South. And also I took this picture a few days later in, the, in Seoul downtown, so City Hall also claiming, um, celebrating this Hanbandoi Unyongal Pakun Nambuk Chongsedam. So the uh, North South Korean summit, which changed the destiny of the Korean Peninsula. Well, um, the Pyongyang Declaration was signed in September uh, that year, where North and South Korean leaders pledged to end uh, the war and promulgated the year of no war. Unfortunately, Koreans cannot, uh, cannot finish the war uh, without partic participants. There were 16 uh, participants in the Korean War and without the UN command and without Chinese people's volunteers, perhaps, ending the Korean War would not be possible. But still, President Moon Jae-in uh, repeatedly um, uh, called upon all parties to formally end the Korean War. This was done last year in 2020, just a few days ago at the United Nations General Assembly uh, meeting, President Moon again um, explained the reason, the, uh, uh, the, nu the nuclearization of the Korean Peninsula and, and peace could be achieved by uh, all parties sitting, uh, sitting down at the negotiating table and formally uh, finishing the, uh, this conflict, which uh, is probably the longest war in, in, in modern history. Um, the armistice agreement, which is currently in place, um, needs to be replaced by the formal uh, peace treaty, uh, with but perhaps with participation of China and the United States, um, which represented the UN command. But will Americans, Chinese, and other neighbors support this plan? So um, I argue that um, some neighbors are more willing to uh, see the peaceful uh, Korean and peaceful, uh, non nuclear, and perhaps neutral Korean Peninsula. Say, um, President Moon Jae in uh, met with President Putin in 2018 in, um, in Vladivostok during the um, uh, Far Eastern Economic Forum. And uh, Chairman Kim Jong un met with President Putin too um, a year later, also at the same, in the same city in Vladivostok. Um, President Moon uh, was proposing a new northern policy towards North Korea and Russia, something similar to what toward uh, former president um, Moon Jae-in um, implemented back in the late 1980s and early 90s. Uh, Kim Jong-un also talked uh, to Putin about potential collaboration. Um, it, there was not much uh, publicized, publicized about the, the essence of their ne negotiations, but it was important that it looked like leaders were rushing to meet with uh, North and South Korean leaders to discuss uh, the future of the region. So um, President Xi Jinping of China visited Pyongyang in June 2019, just, just next month after the summit with, of Kim Jong-un with Putin. And uh, also President Moon visited Beijing um, the, the same year, meeting with Chinese president. Again, the discussions were uh, Kind of focused on peace, um, like the future non-nuclear region, Northeast Asian region, uh, economic cooperation, and um, and of course more. The security issues is, are not confined just simply by rockets and, and bombs. The food security, energy security, um, environmental security uh, issues uh, were also discussed. It's interesting that even the Japanese, uh, former Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe was uh, really keen to meet with Kim Jong-un um, as soon as possible without any preconditions in order to end the long running mistrust between their countries. And of course the humanitarian issue uh, was assumed to be in the center of such discussion. They kidnapped uh, Japanese people um, trapped in, in North Korea. Uh, these days, uh, we have the new Prime Minister, Fumio Kishida, who has already just, there was a telephone conversation uh, with, uh, uh, with, with uh, White House. Uh, 
the pre pre president uh, Biden, where Kishida committed and pledged to support the U.S. in containing uh, China and North Korea. So here we we can only question the the, the future uh, of Japan's relations with uh, with partners uh, on the Korean Peninsula. Will Japan attitude change if inter-Korean relations improve? This is a big question, and um, I believe only time will uh, tell us. Uh, Korea's relations with the U.S. Um, also has been checkered, and it was Donald Trump, the former president who, uh, incumbent president, who really uh, met in person with the North Korean leader um, three times, 2018, um, uh, Singapore, 2019 in uh, um, uh, Hanoi City, and also in the demilitarized zone in 2019 in June, there was a trilateral um, meeting summit uh, where President Moon and Kim, uh, Kim, Kim Jong-un uh, met with the former American president, uh, which looked promising, but uh, peace hasn't been achieved until, until today. So with President Biden, uh, the major question is what will be US policy towards North Korea? Is it going to be based on bilateralism? Uh, something what Donald Trump actually demonstrated the quite successful. Kim Jong-un hasn't detonated a nuclear bomb since uh, 20, uh, 2017, was the last, um, last test. Uh, and with President Trump, it, it all ended. Yes, we can see the, the uh, ballistic missiles, but we'll talk about the ballistic technologies in a moment. Or alternatively, President uh, Biden might um, dwell on multilateralism, something what uh, President Obama um, really uh, advocated. But it was also that policy didn't achieve anything. On the opposite, uh, North Korea became nuclear, self-proclaimed nuclear power as a result of this uh, hands-off policy. Um, there were a number of uh, recent developments and we saw that the Inter-Korean Liaison, Communication Liaison Office, which was established uh, just during that September 2018 summit between um, uh, Moon Jae-in and Kim Jong-un, the office uh, was supposed to help uh, not just militaries in the North and the South, but also um, business people and, um, and, uh, and, and the groups and civil, civil groups to meet and, and reconcile. But something happened in the meantime and in June 2020, remember just 20 years, the day to day of the important, the, the significant summit, the 15th of June uh, joint North South Korean declaration was um, was signed in those days, but upon the order from Pyongyang, this office was demolished. And the military hotline channels uh, have been cut since then until a few days ago. Uh, obviously, there was not much appetite in the North to, um, to communicate. What happened? We can only guess, but a um, number of incidents could have been easily prevented um, at this hotline. Uh, were maintained. Uh, we remember that in September 2020, just uh, a few months later, North Korean military killed a South Korean uh, man. He probably trapped or decided to defect. We don't know exactly what happened, but the man was uh, shot dead in the northern waters of the uh, Korean West Sea. Kim Jong-un uh, immediately apologized to President Moon Jae-in and people of South Korea, um, but um, it, it didn't add much sympathy from it, in the eyes of the South Korean people to, to the North who uh, can easily um, create or escalate tensions because, um, because any, any shot um, across the demilitarized zone or northern limit line may easily lead to um, uh, escalation of tension and, and the uh, and the new uh, resumed hostilities, probably with the usage of weapons of mass destruction. So to avoid that, I think the common sense prevailed. And in early October, uh, so basically at the start of this month, um, after a number of discussions and communication between Seoul and Pyongyang, the uh, North-South Korean hotline was reconnected. So um, it, was, um, it was Kim Jong-un who um, addressed the, the Supreme People Assembly 
just a few days before that, claiming that North Korea has no reasons to provoke or hurt the South. Well, the question, can we, can we trust Kim Jong-un doing this after, after all? Uh, well, President Moon Jae-in was also um, arguing that um, from the podium of the uh, United Nations um, General Assembly, um, uh, calling upon all parties to, to declare the uh, Korean War ended. So is, if, this, if, we, if we assume that now North and South Korea is going to talk and communicate, so what are the possible scenarios which we can expect um, to unfold there? Well, um, I believe that could be the, the bifurcation point here is either we are going to strive to unification or we following the president, former president Kim Tae-jung's suggestion to, to do easy things first and keep the complex uh, tasks for the later, perhaps we can focus on coexistence. Right, well, the unification is, is a complex task. So if it's a violent unification, like right, right? It's something like March North and Unify approach. It can be achieved tomorrow but it's going to be a very expensive exercise. It's going to cost lives. And uh, long-term expense is going to, well, with the destruction of infrastructure and, and uh, loss of life, it is going to be a super expensive um, option. I don't think this price tag is uh, going to be acceptable to anyone. The peaceful um, unification through confederation as a loose form of federation, uh, perhaps it's something what North and South Koreans should strive for. I don't know, federal system like in Australia. Two states um, with their own parliaments and the federal parliament, um, the top which would control the, the, the questions of uh, foreign affairs and, and, uh, and defense is feasible, but again, it's going to be uh, expensive. Even in Europe, um, for East and West Germany, the price tag for unification in the first 10 years after unification uh, was calculated as 2 trillion euros. So in Korea, it's not going to be cheaper in, in, by any, in um, any means. So perhaps we have to focus on coexistence, preferably not hostile, because hostile coexistence with sanctions, isolation, mistrust, skirmishing across the demilitarized zone, basically the continuation of the Cold War, is something what we have been experiencing for too long. And uh, the only exception were the 10 years of sunshine policy, where this coexistence was peaceful in nature. The in, through engagement, economic cooperation, trade, visits, humanitarian action, uh, actions, and um, uh, uh, reunited uh, reunions of, of separated families. So, which scenario would you prefer? Um, I believe that peaceful um, coexistence is something what uh, could help North and South Koreans to collaborate on what they already have. Um, say nuclear uh, program, which North Korea has with uh, Yongbyon nuclear complex, uh, which was designed for uh, scientific purposes. It does not really produce much electricity, five megawatt uh, capacity. It's, um, it doesn't really change much, but with South Korea's uh, capacity to produce electricity with its 23 light water reactors across the southern coastal line, um, export uh, or sharing um, of electricity of energy with the North would significantly improve its economy without really jeopardizing the security of the South. So I believe that North and South Koreans can cooperate in nuclear energy easily. The uh, rocket technologies, yes, um, ex space exploration um, requires the ballistic technology, which is dual usage, right? So it, it, placing an, uh, a, a Sputnik, placing a, a satellite into the orbit um, or launching a rocket with a nuclear device, nuclear warhead would, would require the, basically the same type of the rocket. But North and South Koreans uh, actually had the uh, demonstrated they are equally uh, skilled in, uh, in rocket technologies. UNHA-3 was launched in North Korea in December 2012, 2012 while NARO-1 in South Korea was launched just the, the, the following month. And both North and South Koreans 
can co collaborate and that would improve both telecommunications, uh, weather forecasting, research, even tourism place, who knows. I believe that inter-Korean cooperation in uh, space exploration is, is a feasible one. And if we look at the map of the peaceful or neutral and uh, non-nuclear Korea, it, there's a plenty of um, promising factors which we should um, uh, seriously consider. So South Korea, 10th, economy, 10th largest economy in the world, the non for is 600 billion US dollars worth of exports of, of manufactured goods, but also um, also soft power of South Korea also shouldn't be un um, underestimated. While North Korea is sitting on the 6 trillion US dollars worth of natural resources, including rare earth metals, including the uranium, which may be used for uh, production um, generation of electricity. Uh, so South Korea would, uh, South Korean economy and, and manufacturers would immensely benefit if they have access to this resource. Transportation cor corridors could be, uh, could connect the powerhouse of South Korea uh, with the continent and and also with, with Japan, if the tunnel is uh, drilled um, under the Tsushima Strait, well, we will see the export and import markets uh, uh, increasing, domestic and international tourism growing, and um, foreign investment in research and development in science technology also would be attracted by the peaceful environment and, uh, and the opportunities which the uh, Korean Peninsula may offer. And of course, the environmental projects could be conducted and you can see the demilitarized zone could turn uh, from the scariest place, uh, scariest place on earth into the World Peace Park, as uh, was um, uh, proposed by, by President Moon Jae-in and agreed with uh, Kim Jong-un when they met in Pyongyang. So to finalize um, this talk, I would just have zoom out and, and look at how the neutral, peaceful, non uh, non nuclear Korea could affect the whole Eurasian or tra trans Eurasian cooperation, where the uh, routes, both land, railway uh, routes, and pipelines, electricity grids would connect the peninsula and basically connect the island of South Korea, which is at the moment uh, detached from, from the continent, into. Um, into the conglomerate, into the uh, into the network of uh, cargo, passenger, uh, travel routes between Europe and East Asia, where Korea would use the uh, railway networks of Russia and China, uh, where the um, cooperation with Japan would be boosted. Um, by um, uh, extending the energy cor corridor, say, from Russia via Korea to Japan. And the question is only when this may become possible. So just would like to uh, recap and summarize and emphasize the, the wisdom of uh, independence activist Yu Kil Jun and former South Korean president Kim, Kim Tae Jung, who uh, looked at um, at the road of, of, of unification as a process, which would start with uh, cross recognition. It should be North and South um, who would need to um, look at each other, not as enemies, but as, as, a, as parts of the divided nation, but also the neighbors must recognize um, the, uh, the North Korean state as, as it was planned at the end of the Cold War, where the United States and Japan was expected to uh, they were expected to recognize diplomatically the DPRK uh, in exchange for Soviet Union and China recognizing the Republic of Korea. So Russia and China lived up to, the, to their promise, but US and Japan did not. This would pave way to the formal peace treaty in Korea, uh, which, which is long overdue, which cannot be done at the moment without participation of China and the United States. And giving the neutral status to the Korean Peninsula, I believe, would um, make it um, make it possible, uh, sort of uh, ease the tensions in the region in general, um, because neutral states don't need nuclear weapons, and there's nothing to um, 
claim for the neighbors uh, who might be nervous that the US allied South Korea would be uh, would come closer to the China or Russian borders. Um, so neutrality and non-nuclear status of Korea would secure the peaceful coexistence of the Korean states and lead to the some form of political uh, reintegration of the Korean Peninsula through confederation and perhaps federation ultimately. And this would be the unification uh, goal achieved. And this four steps roadmap, I believe, uh, is, is logical, cheap, and, and quite practical. Uh, there's nothing new has been proclaimed more than 100 years ago, 120 years ago, by Yukil Jun, supported by President Kim Tae-jung 20 years ago. And I believe that uh, that's something what we uh, can discuss and should seriously contemplate. Thank you very much for your attention. Here are my contact details if you want to use, uh, if you cannot stay longer and want to shoot an email or visit my blog and mm. read more, learn more about North and South Korea. Uh, thank you. And I'll stop sharing um, here. Thank you for your attention. And um, Richard, so please play the role of, of the moderator. Sure. If you don't mind. There were there's seven well, questions or comments which I haven't <laughs> had a chance to look at, but I think can help. Sure. Well, I think it's worked well this way, Leonard. Um, in case I forget to say it, thank you very much, Leonard. That's you, you have a breadth of knowledge that's just a wonderful gift. And I might say you have a very warm human heart as well, and it comes together. It's come together wonderfully tonight. Uh, we've got two questions. The, the first one here is from Aram Kim. I think you can, everybody can see it. It's a very thoughtful, well-worded question. Uh, so perhaps you've, if you'd address that first, Leonard, and then Peter Wilson has a, a request for a comment on a statement he's made about the 1953 Mutual Defence Treaty. So if we could address those two to begin with, that would be that would be good. But everybody, I think you in your chat you can see Aram Kim's uh, question. Maybe if we just take a moment to read it. Yes, thank you, Richard. Yeah, I'll have a, I'll read that. Um, it has to do with the role of the United States, of course, which is a significant factor. Um, do you think it's realistically possible for South Korea and North Korea to create any significant uh, progress towards peace without the shift in position of US, China, and Russia? Okay, that's the first question. Hmm. Um, so currently, I think all uh, neighbors, um, including Japan, I think everyone prefers the status quo. Um, any shift, and the problem with, uh, with the, any change of the status quo is something that goes back to the Sino-Japanese war, Russo-Japanese war. Um, neighbors are, re are re really worried about Korean Peninsula being influenced by one or another uh, neighbor. So they prefer to keep uh, Korea divided at the expense of, uh, of Korean, um, Korean people's future and, and present, present. I believe that uh, only Russia, um, I think, is more positive um, about the well, if not unification, but at least peaceful collaboration between North and South Korea, because Russia is basically interested in uh, selling resources. And the more stable, more peaceful the Korean Peninsula is, the, like the, the, the better sales are going to be achieved. While US and China are in the middle of the trade war, and I believe that um, they can see the Korea as a balancer, uh, which may swing one way or another if it's unified or at least if it's controlled. But if, if Korea is proclaimed to be neutral, it cannot be done overnight. Because, um, it should be some internal domestic um, appetite for, for that, the internal drive, like we mean job three. So Koreans in North and South must collaborate and, and, and achieve uh, this consensus that Korea is, um, is neutral 
and therefore non-nuclear. In that case, perhaps US and China should not worry about Korea, but improving the uh, growing market, currently North Korean market is closed for so US or Chinese um, you know, manufacturers, producers, services. Mm -hmm. uh, if it's all done in the um, in a way where Korea is one, uh, perhaps perhaps China and and Japan will win, but who will lose? It will be Japan, because Japan Japanese manufacturers are going to compete not just against um, China and Korea, but also against the unified Korea, which is going to be much more um, uh, much more powerful in terms of access to resources, uh, workforce, skilled, uh, disciplined workforce in the north, technology know-how in the south, and an international investment from elsewhere would rush to the Korean Peninsula, not to Japan. So I think that um, we should also keep Japan in this picture. Also, do you believe the um, Republic of Korea maintaining strong alliance with the US, which I believe is in part um, this is stated by South Korean internal political needs as well. Uh, historical international uh, real concern about US hostility toward, uh, towards it. Do you think it is realistically possible for South Korea and North Korea to create any significant progress toward peace without the shift in position? Um, well, at the moment, the domestic situation in North and South is also not very stable. Something happened in the North. Right? So Kim Jong-un has been, well, he was ill um, in April last year. After that, we saw the demolition of inter-Korean uh, communication liaison office uh, ordered by his younger sister, not by Kim Jong Un, by his younger sister Kim Yo Jong. Why was it so? Maybe Kim Jong Un was incapacitated. Maybe something. Maybe he was, he tried to use Kim Yo Jong as a bad cop while he was trying to keep his own image as a good cop. We don't know. But so far, Kim Jong Un was re re refusing to meet with President Moon Jae In in person. Is he permanently ill? something happened is it a double man is kim jong-un dead and buried we don't know something is not right and the um economic and food crisis which north korea is currently experiencing is not a joke and um it, it could have been alleviated by inter-korean summit and collaboration and it was not so something prevents north korea from um accepting help from not only from China, but also from South Korea. They have been refusing help under the pretext of uh, potential contamination with coronavirus. We don't know whether it's true or not. And all these um, parades, night, midnight parades in Pyongyang also look very suspicious. I don't know what something is mm. going on there. While in South Korea, we see that the President Moon Jae-in is a lame duck now. Mm. Election, national election is coming next year. And who is going to win the election in South Korea? Very likely, well, given the lack of success and progress in the inter-Korean front, well, perhaps uh, going to be uh, conservative uh, parties, right-wing politicians, and that will be the end of, of uh, current inter-Korean rapprochement for a long time, for another, mm. um, another five years. Who knows? So I believe that um, we have to consider not only international players, but also domestic uh, political dynamics, but also the natural disasters, which North Korea was hit badly last year. And, and of course, the COVID pandemic um, kept North Korea isolated, not only, um, not only by the international efforts, but also naturally. North Korea is now uh, totally um, isolated itself. And they're not in a hurry to open up for some reasons. I believe the stability of the regime depends on its isolation. As long as North Korea is isolated, the longer the regime is going to stay there. Mm -hmm. So the North is not desperate in communicating with the South. Uh, and also this uh, most recent development, the um, resumption of port line between North and South, I believe it's, um, it's simply, it's not a trick, but simply a, a, a pawn in the future game, whether they can have a more leverage in achieving something by threatening the disconnection of port line. They don't have the hotline, they, they cannot really. Mm. Mm. Leonard, Play thank me. you very much. We've we've come to an hour and but we're not under starter's orders to finish it exactly on the hour. And there are I can see questions here from uh, Victor, 
And uh, before that, a request from Peter Wilson for you to comment on a statement that Peter has put there. And Edward Park has a question. So perhaps we'll close the questions. No more questions, everyone, but we'll ask Leonard to comment on the questions that are there. The first one, Leonard, is a statement from Peter Wilson. If the 1953 Mutual uh, Defense Treaty did not exist, the two Koreas would have long uh, ago implemented the uh, 1972 Joint Declaration of Mutual Defense Treaty, um, I assume the Republic of Korea and, and the US, but also the China-North uh, Korea uh, Treaty of, um, uh, what's the name, official name of that, um, treaty which puts China uh, into the role of uh, potential protector of North Korea, if it's under attack, of course. So both treaties, well, they were mirroring each other. And I think that, again, we, we see that uh, both Beijing and, the, and Washington DC are nervous about what may happen on the Korean Peninsula. Uh, that's why South Korea has the contingent of troops in, in the South and, and North Korea expects, again, if it's under attack that China would march its troops like it was back in the Imjin War and um, like it was in during the, um, uh, the 19th century conflicts. Um, so there's still over reliance on, on great powers by mm. politicians in North and South Korea. And that's what makes it worse. This is what uh, actually creates uh, more trouble um, for Koreans themselves if they over rely on that. Sade uh, the uh, Taoism, flunkism, many different translations of Sadejui, the worshiping of the great power, create problems to Korea. It, it put Korea into trouble of um, colonization by Japan because Korea was just kind of trying to uh, rely uh, too much on China, but uh, later on Russia, and then finally Japan uh, got Korea as, as, a, uh, as a prize of, of colonization. And these days, again, um, North Koreans are concerned that they might not be able to defend themselves um, if China is not stepping in. That's why North Koreans need the nuclear weapons. They don't need many nuclear weapons. They just need one. If they have one nuclear device, that is a, a sufficient deterrent against any potential um, regime change effort or any uh, any inv invasion or even prevent uh, pre preventive strike. Mm. So uh, they know that China might not might be reluctant to do something. But uh, well, with South Koreans also see every time Americans like it was with President Trump, Americans threatened to withdraw that 20, 28,000 um, American troops from South Korea. South Koreans start panicking. They believe that they cannot defend themselves against nuclear power North Korea. So this over reliance on neighboring or superpowers put Korea into the precarious situation that they have to uh, stay divided. And as a result, um, they may be targeted if, if the war, like not just Cold War, but hostilities. And now these days we talk about uh, uh, a real possibility of hostilities between China and the United States because of Taiwan, because of something else. Um, mm -hmm. Korea will be target number one because of the uh, contingent of significant contingent of troops. Uh, missiles, nuclear weapons, conventional weapons, um, and transportation routes, which may help one army or another. Leonard, there's a question here from Victor. What, in your opinion, is the largest obstacle to the possibility of cooperation? Uh, the largest obstacle to the possibility of cooperation, if we talk about, okay, uh, economic cooperation or political cooperation, I think they are slightly two different um, areas. Um, say, if North and South Koreans don't do anything else but permit their business people to work, uh, from South Korean perspective, it's going to be okay, uh, but still the national security law would be the main constraint. Who can go to North Korea and how often? and how much money they can bring. So that would affect uh, the, uh, the security of the Republic of Korea. Same in the North. Uh, they have, uh, they consider still the Korean war is continuing. How can they possibly permit 
the spies and enemies to cross the demilitarized zone and and walk around and invest and talk to their people. So this consideration of the uh, continuing war is the main impediment. So the, mm -hmm. unless the war is formally ended, cooperation, business cooperation would always be looked at uh, with suspicion as an attempt to undermine each other's security, both North and South, they wouldn't trust each other. So the continuing war is the main problem, although it's not kind of hot type of war, but periodically we see some defectors crawling or running or swimming across the demilitarized zone, northern limit line, and they often they're being shot at from both sides. So mm. this is the problem. Leonard, the last question I can see is from Edward Park. Wintech, uh, can Focus. you tell us? Can you see that one? Can you tell us the challenges of post? Post AUKUS. AUKUS. Yes. Well, yeah, AUKUS is now, um, yeah, well, again, we are part of the um, Indo-Pacific uh, area, the new term, and term in geopolitics, which didn't exist until recently. And I would, I would love to uh, greet uh, brothers and sisters across the Tasman, you're, you're probably now sitting in a safer or at least healthier part of, of the um, Indo-Pacific area, at least non-nuclear one. Uh, Australia is, is, it looks like uh, we're going towards the nuclear option. Australia going nuclear, at least with nuclear submarines, that's what AUKUS is, is about. And also we are linked now, we're going to be linked even, uh, even stronger to the uh, US, U UK, uh, alliance, uh, which is currently a confrontation with China and its allies like North Korea. Mm. So um, the challenges of post AUKUS, um, I don't know what post AUKUS is because we just entered the AUKUS um, and, it, and it hasn't been approved, it hasn't been ratified. It's just been, uh, you know, politicians in Canberra just proclaimed one like uh, out of the blue that uh, now we're going to be nuclear, we'll have nuclear uh, submarines. Mm what it means. No, it hasn't been discussed yet. And I attribute it to the, uh, the pandemic environment where many political decisions can be uh, announced without really proper debate, consideration, deliberation. So I don't know whether the AUKUS is actually going to be, uh, well, eventually implemented. Um, I have doubts about mm. it. I think people in Australia, in New Zealand, uh, will be vehemently against and oppose the, uh, that, that possibility. But who knows? So um, I think that we are just standing on the on the, on the verge of, of very important decisions, and much will depend on uh, relationship between uh, Washington DC and Beijing. And it looks like they are trying to sort of figure out what to do next. So we we don't have much power in that. We simply can either watch and. Um, and applaud or, or going to be involved against our own uh, will into whatever is going to in a, another drama which may unfold in East Asia, hopefully not. Mm -hmm. How do you feel about um, to apply the pan-Asianism by An chung for unification? Well, An chung was the um, uh, independence, uh, Yolsa, uh, Yolsa, uh, independence warrior, independence uh, figure. And uh, pan Asianism, well, uh, it was compromised by the Japanese uh, effort of wartime efforts to bring Asia, the four corners under one roof, and ended badly, it turned into fascism and militarism and, and uh, huge devastation. So, pan Asianism, I think it's a wrong word. So, globalism is, a, is a better, in my opinion, right? So, we should collaborate, cooperate. Uh, regardless the distance, uh, both geographic distance or cultural distance, administrative distance, it, sh it shouldn't really matter. Look, we, we, we're just sitting in different parts of the world right now and uh, basically in the same um, digital cyber environment, discussing, sharing ideas and planning scenarios. So that's, that's what globalism, pan-Asianism, I think it's from the 20th uh, century, it's old, sorry. Mm. Well, Leonard, uh, there's a final comment there. It's not a question, but it's a substantial comment there from Ok. And I notice a number of comments of appreciation to you from, I can see one from Graham and Anna and a number of people. So uh, please 
accept and read those comments of appreciation there. But I think everyone, we've probably come to the end of this formal uh, meeting. Leonard Petrov is a very obliging, accommodating man. And I'm sure if you sent him an email with a question, you'd get a reply. But I think uh, Leonard will let you rest now. And I'd like everybody to uh, show their appreciation by clapping silently or loudly, but at least Leonard will see us. And, uh, Thank you very much. Thank you. I would love to um, take a picture. And um, so, um, yeah, that's what I do with print screen. So the picture yeah. is taken. Thank you for your uh, time and interest in the topic. And I and let's stay in touch. I will share again the slide with my contact details. You're welcome to send an email or uh, just read my blog or be uh, my friend in the Facebook. Um, I um, welcome basically everyone. Most of the most posts are public and they're publicly available. So and this uh, session has been recorded. Mm -hmm. So I. Um, being broadcast and streamed in the Facebook. So we'll be, if Richard and, uh, and, and Chung Mi don't mind, I will share this uh, record on my Facebook and all friends mm -hmm. and friends of New Zealand Republic of Korea who, who cannot or who could not uh, participate today uh, will, uh, will, will have an opportunity to watch it and, uh, and think about, about this mm -hmm. ongoing pro problem and ongoing drama, but hopefully the uh, light at the end of the tunnel is, is already looming somewhere. Again, thank you, Leonard. And thank you, everybody who's participated, who's come tonight. We are here because we have a heart for the Korean people and the Korean peninsula. Uh, and I hope we see you again soon, all participants here. Jong Mi, Ko Jong Mi, would you like to say something in Korean at the very end? Uh, I wanted to somebody from. Uh, Petrov, could you somebody just shoot one to few minutes for me in Korean? Uh, yeah, 한국말로 말씀 yeah. 좀 드리고 싶은 거 많은데 시간이 부족해서 죄송합니다. 그런데 well, uh, 아까 말씀드린 거 같이 통일보다 공존에 대해서 좀 신경 신경 써야 봐야 되겠습니다. About peaceful coexistence. Even and uh, 그리고 통일 시간이 될 때도 uh, 북진 통일 아니고 뭐 흡수 통일 말고 uh, 평화스러운 통일을 기원합니다. So I would really welcome the peaceful unification, peaceful cooperation um, and unification ultimately, rather than uh, achieving it by force, by war, by absorption. So I, I hope that my presentation today um, made it clear and I believe you agree with my point of view. But if you don't, I um, would, would love to discuss it further. And I, and thank you, Richard, and thank you, Chongmi, for inviting me second time to the uh, New Zealand Republic of Korea Friendship uh, uh, Society Symposium on Korea. You're doing the great, um, great work and uh, bringing the community in, in New Zealand, in Australia, in the world um, to this important topic um, actually I believe brings closer the wonderful moment of uh, inter-Korean reconciliation, cooperation and unification one day. Thank you Leonard, thank you Jongmi. One more applause everybody and uh, we'll let... Thank you all for Thanks. being here, have a good night, a good safe night everybody. Um, thank you, I'll stop recording. Sure. And...